Chapter One of Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit org. Recording by Peter Eastman. Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens by J. M. Barry. Chapter One, The Grand Tour of the Gardens. You must see for yourselves that it will be difficult to follow Peter Pan's adventures unless you are familiar with the Kensington Gardens. They are in London, where the King lives, and I used to take David there nearly every day, unless he was looking decidedly flushed. No child has ever been in the whole of the gardens, because it is so soon time to turn back. The reason it is soon time to turn back is that, if you are as small as David, you sleep from twelve to one. If your mother was not so sure that you sleep from twelve to one, you could most likely see the whole of them. The gardens are bounded on one side by a never-ending line of omnibuses, over which your nurse has such authority that if she holds up her finger to any one of them it stops immediately. She then crosses with you in safety to the other side. There are more gates to the gardens than one gate, but that is the one you go in at. And before you go in, you speak to the lady with the balloons, who sits just outside. This is as near to being inside as she may venture, because if she were to let go her hold of the railings for one moment, the balloons would lift her up and she would be flown away. She sits very squat, for the balloons are always tugging at her, and the strain has given her quite a red face. Once she was a new one, because the old one had let go, and David was very sorry for the old one. But as she did let go, he wished he had been there to see. The gardens are a tremendous big place, with millions and hundreds of trees. And first you come to the figs, but you scorn to loiter there, for the figs is the resort of superior little persons who are forbidden to mix with the commonality, and is so named, according to legend, because they dress in full fig. These dainty ones are themselves contemptuously called figs by David and other heroes, and you have a key to the manners and customs of this dandiacal section of the gardens when I tell you that cricket is called crickets here. Occasionally a rebel fig climbs over the fence into the world, and such a one was Miss Mabel Gray, of whom I shall tell you when we come to Miss Mabel Gray's gate. She was the only really celebrated fig. We are now in the broad walk, and it is as much bigger than the other walks as your father is bigger than you. David wondered if it began little and grew and grew until it was quite grown up, and whether the other walks are its babies. And he drew a picture which diverted him very much, of the broad walk giving a tiny walk an airing in a perambulator. In the broad walk you meet all the people who are worth knowing, and there is usually a grown-up with them to prevent them going on the damp grass, and to make them stand disgraced at the corner of a seat if they have been Mad Dog or Mary Annish. To be Mary Annish is to behave like a girl, whimpering because nurse won't carry you, or simpering with your thumb in your mouth, and it is a hateful quality. But to be Mad Dog is to kick out at everything, and there is some satisfaction in that. If I were to point out all the notable places as we pass up the broad walk, it would be time to turn back before we reach them. And I simply wave my stick at Checo Hewlett's tree, that memorable spot where a boy called Checo lost his penny, and looking for it found tuppence. There has been a good deal of excavation going on there ever since. Farther up the walk is the little wooden house in which Marmaduke Perry hid. There is no more awful story of the gardens than this of Marmaduke Perry, who had been Mary Annish three days in succession, and was sentenced to appear in the broad walk dressed in his sister's clothes. 
he hid in the little wooden house, and refused to emerge until they brought him knickerbockers with pockets. You now try to go to the round pond, but nurses hate it because they are not really manly, and they make you look the other way, at the big penny and the baby's palace. She was the most celebrated baby of the gardens, and lived in the palace all alone with ever so many dolls. So people rang the bell, and up she got out of her bed, though it was past six o'clock, and she lighted a candle, and opened the door in her nighty, and then they all cried with great rejoicings, Hail Queen of England! What puzzled David most was how she knew where the matches were kept. The big penny is a statue about her. Next we come to the hump, which is the part of the broad walk where all the big races are run. And even though you had no intention of running, you do run when you come to the hump. It is such a fascinating slide-down kind of place. Often you stop when you have run about halfway down it, and then you are lost. But there is another little wooden house near here, called the Lost House, and so you tell the man that you are lost, and then he finds you. It is glorious fun racing down the hump, but you can't do it on windy days, because then you are not there, but the fallen leaves do it instead of you. There is almost nothing that has such a keen sense of fun as a fallen leaf. From the hump we can see the gate that is called after Miss Mabel Gray, the fig I promised to tell you about. There were always two nurses with her, or else one mother and one nurse, and for a long time she was a pattern child, who always coughed off the table and said, How do you do? to the other figs, and the only game she played at was flinging a ball gracefully and letting the nurse bring it back to her. Then one day she tired of it all, and went mad dog. And first, to show that she really was mad dog, she unloosened both her bootlaces, and put out her tongue east, west, north, and south. She then flung her sash into a puddle, and danced on it till dirty water was squirted over her frock, after which she climbed the fence, and had a series of incredible adventures, one of the least of which was that she kicked off both her boots. At last she came to the gate that is now called after her, out of which she ran, into streets David and I have never been in, though we have heard them roaring. And still she ran on, and would never again have been heard of, had not her mother jumped into a bus and thus overtaken her. It all happened, I should say, long ago, and this is not the Mabel Gray whom David knows. Returning up the broad walk, we have on our right the baby walk, which is so full of perambulators that you could cross from side to side stepping on babies, but the nurses won't let you do it. From this walk a passage called Bunting's Thumb, because it is that length, leads into Picnic Street, where there are real kettles, and chestnut blossom falls into your mug as you are drinking. Quite common children picnic here also and the blossom falls into their mugs just the same. Next comes St. Gopher's Well, which was full of water when Malcolm the Bold fell into it. He was his mother's favorite, and he let her put her arm round his neck in public because she was a widow. But he was also partial to adventures, and liked to play with a chimney sweep who had killed a good many bears. The sweep's name was Sooty, and one day, when they were playing near the well, Malcolm fell in, and would have been drowned had not Sooty dived in and rescued him. And the water had washed Sooty clean, and he now stood revealed as Malcolm's long-lost father. So Malcolm would not let his mother put her arm round his neck any more. Between the well and the round pond are the cricket pitches, and frequently the choosing of sides exhausts so much time that there is scarcely any cricket. Everybody wants to bat first, and as soon as he is out, he bowls, unless you are the better wrestler. And while you are wrestling with him, the fielders have scattered to play at something else. 
the gardens are noted for two kinds of cricket. Boy cricket, which is real cricket with a bat, and girl cricket, which is with a racket and the governess. Girls can't really play cricket, and when you are watching their futile efforts you make funny sounds at them. Nevertheless, there was a very disagreeable incident one day when some forward girls challenged David's team, and a disturbing creature called Angela Clare sent down so many Yorkers that— However, instead of telling you the result of that regrettable match, I shall pass on hurriedly to the round pond, which is the wheel that keeps all the gardens going. It is round because it is in the very middle of the gardens, and when you are come to it you never want to go any farther. You can't be good all the time at the round pond, however much you try. You can be good in the broad walk all the time, but not at the round pond, and the reason is that you forget, and when you remember you are so wet that you may as well be wetter. There are men who sail boats on the round pond, such big boats that they bring them in barrows, and sometimes in perambulators, and then the baby has to walk. The bow-legged children in the gardens are those who had to walk too soon because their father needed the perambulator. You always want to have a yacht to sail on the round pond, and in the end your uncle gives you one, and to carry it to the pond the first day is splendid. Also to talk about it to boys who have no uncle is splendid. But soon you like to leave it at home. For the sweetest craft that slips her moorings in the round pond is what is called a stick-boat, because she is rather like a stick until she is in the water and you are holding the string. Then as you walk round pulling her, you see little men running about her deck, and sails rise magically and catch the breeze, and you put in on dirty nights at snug harbors which are unknown to the lordly yachts. Night passes in a twink and again your rakish craft noses for the wind, whales spout, you glide over buried cities, and have brushes with pirates, and cast anchor on coral isles. You are a solitary boy while all this is taking place, for two boys together cannot adventure far upon the round pond, and though you may talk to yourself throughout the voyage, giving orders and executing them with dispatch, you know not when it is time to go home, where you have been, or what swelled your sails. Your treasure trove is all locked away in your hold, so to speak, which will be opened, perhaps, by another little boy many years afterwards. But those yachts have nothing in their hold. Does any one return to this haunt of his youth because of the yachts that used to sail it? Oh, no, it is the stick-boat that is freighted with memories. The yachts are toys, their owner a freshwater mariner. They can cross and recross a pond only, while the stick-boat goes to sea. You yachtsmen with your wands, who think we are all there to gaze on you, your ships are only accidents of this place, and were they all to be boarded and sunk by the ducks? the real business of the round pond would be carried on as usual. Paths from everywhere crowd like children to the pond. Some of them are ordinary paths, which have a rail on each side, and are made by men with their coats off. But others are vagrants, wide at one spot, and at another so narrow that you can stand astride them. They are called paths that have made themselves and David did wish he could see them doing it. But, like all the most wonderful things that happen in the gardens, it is done, we concluded, at night after the gates are closed. We have also decided that the paths make themselves because it is their only chance of getting to the round pond. One of these gypsy paths comes from the place where the sheep get their hair cut. When David shed his curls at the hairdresser's, I am told, he said good-bye to them without a tremor, though his mother has never been quite the same bright creature since. So he despises the sheep as they run from their shearer, and calls out tauntingly, Cowardly, cowardly custard! 
But when the man grips them between his legs, David shakes a fist at him for using such big scissors. Another startling moment is when the man turns back the grimy wool from the sheep's shoulders, and they look suddenly like ladies in the stalls of a theatre. The sheep are so frightened by the shearing that it makes them quite white and thin, and as soon as they are set free they begin to nibble the grass at once quite anxiously, as if they feared that they would never be worth eating. David wonders whether they know each other now that they are so different, and if it makes them fight with the wrong ones. They are great fighters, and thus so unlike country sheep that every year they give my St. Bernard dog, Porthos, a shock. He can make a field of country sheep fly by merely announcing his approach, but these town sheep come toward him with no promise of gentle entertainment, and then a light from last year breaks upon Porthos. He cannot with dignity retreat, but he stops and looks about him as if lost in admiration of the scenery, and presently he strolls away with a fine indifference, and a glint at me from the corner of his eye. The Serpentine begins near here. It is a lovely lake, and there is a drowned forest at the bottom of it. If you peer over the edge, you can see the trees, all growing upside down, and they say that at night there are also drowned stars in it. If so, Peter Pan sees them when he is sailing across the lake in the thrush's nest. A small part only of the Serpentine is in the gardens, for soon it passes beneath a bridge to far away where the island is on which all the birds are born that become baby boys and girls. No one who is human, except Peter Pan, and he is only half human, can land on the island, but you may write what you want, boy or girl, dark or fair, on a piece of paper, and then twist it into the shape of a boat and slip it into the water, and it reaches Peter Pan's island after dark. We are on the way home now, though, of course, it is all pretense that we can go to so many of the places in one day. I should have had to be carrying David long ago, and resting on every seat like old Mr. Salford. That was what we called him, because he always talked to us of a lovely place called Salford where he had been born. He was a crab-apple of an old gentleman, who wandered all day in the gardens from seat to seat, trying to fall in with somebody who was acquainted with the town of Salford, and when we had known him for a year or more, we actually did meet another aged solitary who had once spent Saturday to Monday in Salford. He was meek and timid, and carried his address inside his hat, and whatever part of London he was in search of, he always went to Westminster Abbey first as a starting point. Him we carried in triumph to our other friend with the story of that Saturday to Monday, and never shall I forget the gloating joy with which Mr. Salford leapt at him. They have been cronies ever since, and I noticed that Mr. Salford, who naturally does most of the talking, keeps tight grip of the other old man's coat. The last two places before you come to our gate are the Dog Cemetery and the Chaffinch's Nest, but we pretend not to know what the Dog Cemetery is, as Porthos is always with us. The nest is very sad. It is quite white, and the way we found it was wonderful. We were having another look among the bushes for David's lost worsted ball, and instead of the ball we found a lovely nest made of the worsted, and containing four eggs, with scratches on them very like David's handwriting, so we think they must have been the mother's love letters to the little ones inside. Every day we were in the gardens we paid a call at the nest, taking care that no cruel boy should see us, and we dropped crumbs, and soon the bird knew us as friends, and sat in the nest looking at us kindly, with her shoulders hunched up. But one day when we went there were only two eggs in the nest, and the next time there were none. The saddest part of it was that the poor little chaffinch fluttered about the bushes, looking so reproachfully at us that we knew she thought we had done it, and though David tried to explain to her, it was so long since he had spoken the bird language that I fear she did not understand. He and I left the gardens that day with our knuckles in our eyes. 
End of chapter 1